Duncan, welcome to the program. Thank you. Can I first of all ask you why you wrote the book? Yeah, I think um, the book is a, a, an Oxfam book and, and what we looked at was trying to produce a, a narrative about where the world is going, how we've got to where we are, which is very broad, which is for people who are looking for a big picture of, of what are the challenges for this century, what's going on with development. So rather than a specific policy paper about one particular issue, we just thought let's stand back and take a big picture. Can we look at uh, inequality and its impact? First of all, how does inequality look? It looks, I mean, I went to Brazil, for example, and in Brazil, which is one of the most unequal countries in the world, you have this extraordinary situation where you have modern condominiums right next to uh, what they call favelas, the shanty towns, and you've actually got the rich and the poor eyeballing each other, you know, almost in the same space. But the, the, the kids born in the favela uh, have a completely different life expectancy. They're, gonna, they're more likely to die young, they're less likely to get a decent education, they're more likely to be sick, malnourished, and yet they're looking at people who have a completely modern lifestyle um, at, at the other extreme. And increasingly you've got that sort of cheek by jowl, uh, haves and have nots on wealth, food, access to fuel, all sorts of uh, technology, yeah, th those gaps are just opening all the time. So the rich are getting richer, the poor getting poorer? Absolutely. The, the, the richest 500 people in the world now earn as much as the 416 million poorest people. It's almost one to a million. You've got people who are living almost unchanged for centuries and people who have more wealth than they know what to do with. You have 800 million people who are going hungry and about the same number of people who actually have health problems because they're obese. You know, these, this is immoral, unjust and hugely wasteful. How widespread is this inequality? Is that increasing? Yeah, so in a country like China, for example, it started off 30 years ago, fairly equal, fairly equitable, this is the word we use. Um, and, uh, and over the course of 30 years, it's grown massively, but most of the wealth is concentrated on the coast. And so you've gone from a kind of Asian level of inequality to a Latin American level of inequality within China, much higher level. Um, but, uh, but not all countries are like that. Vietnam, for example, has grown at a similar speed to China, but it's managed by investing in small farmers, by investing in where the poor are, to actually bring everybody with it. So, so uh, I think there are messages of hope as well as messages of, of concern. What's the impact of inequality? I think the impact is um, uh, at the extreme end, social breakdown. So the kind of violence you get where um, kids are just seeing that they're never going to have what the the kid across the street has and they turn to crime or um, other forms of sort of uh, banditry. Um, you've got tension within countries between regions which have and regions which, ha which don't have. So it, it leads to a kind of chaotic political instability. I think it leads to um, a sort of moral erosion in that people no longer feel they're part of the same society when they see such grotesque extremes. So you don't feel like you're all in this together, you actually feel those people aren't really people. And so you get a kind of a real moral problem, I think, within society as well that, it, that springs from these, these levels of inequality. You talk of the best way to tackle this um, is through a combination of what you call active citizenship and effective states. Can we first of all look at active citizenship? What is that? Well, I think if you actually talk to people who are living in poverty, they don't say poverty is just not having a certain amount of income. They say being poor is about being vulnerable, a sense of risk, fear about tomorrow. What happens if my, uh, if the breadwinner gets injured? What happens if there's a drought, if the cow dies? All that kind of stuff. Um, where they, and, the, and the way to deal with that sense of risk and vulnerability is to make people more stronger within themselves. So you start with the sense of dignity, the sense that I have rights, that I have a voice which people should listen to. And out of that, you, you then with that power, sense of power within, People can then start organising in groups and saying, actually, we want street lighting, we want uh, schools that are decent for our kids. And then you get a sense of, of movement and a sense of um, uh, active citizenship, which is the phrase I use, as a kind of a vital way to actually empower people and achieve real development. How, how does it work on the coalface? Because, say, imagine if you're a, a, a mother with several children in extreme poverty, and it's daily grind and to see beyond that and to do anything beyond that is, is there's enormous obstacles there. Oh, it's extraordinary, especially um, um, mothers, sort of women-headed households, single mothers, as you described. It always astonishes me that at the end of all that, they will still go out to the community meeting and they will still go and pro sort of protest and demand things and they're usually quite vigorous and often ferocious in, in terms of making those demands. Um, 
uh, people do get tired, people do get worn out, but time and time again you see people willing to go and actually make those extra uh, cases because they see it as essential to their community prospering. Another effective way of combating this is what you call uh, effective states. Now this is on a bigger scale, can yeah. you explain that? Yeah, I, um, if you actually look at development in terms of growing the economy, not all those issues of risk and vulnerability and fear I was talking about, then the key thing is actually having a state which uh, delivers schools and hospitals, roads, um, electricity which doesn't go off every five seconds, phones that work and creates a business where, uh, an environment where business will invest and create jobs and people can start to move forward. Um, and there's loads of examples of those and they're not all, many of them are in East Asia but I actually went to one of the most successful economies in the world over the last 40 years which is Botswana in Southern Africa. Tiny country, landlocked, mostly desert, should be a basket case. It's actually done incredibly well by harnessing the wealth from its diamond deposits and spending the wealth well. And as a result, the country's been transformed. So this effective state piece is, is along with active citizens, seem to be the two areas where development really springs from. You mentioned earlier China and then you compared it to Vietnam. Why is China's gap growing and Vietnam's isn't? I think one reason is that China decided to put all its eggs in manufacturing, in the manufacturing basket, if you like. That they, they said, OK, we're going to build loads of factories all along the coast, and that's going to be the driver. And actually to do that, to raise the money to do that, we're going to tax the peasants, we're going to let prices for peasant crops go down, because it's going to be industry that takes us forward. And therefore, the peasantry got poorer, and you've got this big gap opening up between manufacturing and, and the countryside. Whereas in Vietnam, they said, no, actually, we want stable prices so that peasants will still be OK, and we're going to invest in agriculture. And that's made a big difference to the way Vietnam has grown. Are you optimistic? I'm totally optimistic. I think what we, yeah, one thing about going around Oxfam projects is you just see huge successes in country after country after country. Um, and then when you step back and read the history, you see these big national successes as well. If we were sitting here in 1800 and we're having this discussion about slavery, uh, you could have made a perfectly good argument that actually it was economically impossible to abolish slavery. The British economy, the European economies relied on slave labour to produce the sugar, which was providing the calories for their industry, industrial workforce. And yet, 30 years later, slavery was abolished. If we were sitting here in 1900, New Zealand would have been the only country in the world where women had the vote. And yet, 100 years later, 120 countries had women voting. So you can have these big changes, and it's all about the notion of self-interest being enlightened and long-term will actually allow people to see that reforms can be good for everyone. And I think that's where we're at with poverty. There's no reason, there's enough money in the world. You know, it would cost one-tenth of the cost of the Iraq war to abolish poverty altogether. You know, we have, there's enough money in the world, it's, it's, it's people making decisions about how that money is spent. Duncan, thanks very much for your time. Thank you.